But Jesus cares for us so much that he let himself be arrested. Sadly, things didn't get any better for Jesus after he was arrested. The Bible tells us that angry people began to spit in Jesus' face and beat him with their fists, and some slapped him. But Jesus was willing to be beaten because he cares for us so much. Some soldiers made a crown of thorns and put it on Jesus' head. Then they put a stick in his hand and made fun of him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! But Jesus was willing to be made fun of because he cares for all of us very much. Then the soldiers made Jesus carry a heavy wooden cross through town to the place where he would be killed on the cross. On a lonely hill, the soldiers nailed Jesus to the cross. And Jesus died. Jesus was willing to die on the cross because he cares for us with an amazing love. After Jesus died, his friends took his body off the cross and placed it in a dark tomb, a lot like a cave. They rolled a huge rock in front of the cave to seal it. Three days after Jesus died, some friends went to visit Jesus' tomb and were very surprised to see the huge stone rolled away and the tomb open. They looked in the tomb, and suddenly two angels appeared in bright, dazzling robes. The angel said, Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He's risen. Jesus was alive again. Jesus' caring love for us is more powerful than sin. He died on the cross to take the punishment for our sins, the wrong things we all do and proved He is the Messiah. When we believe in Jesus, He gives us a way to live with Him forever in a home called Heaven. It's truly amazing the way Jesus cares for us. Thank you! Let's fill this place with a big joyful sound of a song to thank Jesus. When you're jumping, jumping up and down, These are uh, considered flower boxes. 
These are the things that you can actually put in your garden, and they have wild seed mixed in with some clay and some dirt, and just water them, and they're going to sprout local wildflowers that are local to you. So the kids have made some to take home to their families. There might be some extras if you want to take some, absolutely. But this is to just remind everybody that God made a beautiful world for us, and that we also, yeah, we are going to share in it. So. Thank you. Not a
I noticed on that last song, some of us couldn't get down low, nor could we jump high. <laughs> Thank you, Kim, for setting that all up. We're going to be doing communion down on the floor this morning. We have the, the bread and the juice packets that we'll be giving to you to take back to your seat. We'll take communion together this morning as well. Thank you so much, Justine, for all that. And everybody, now... Let's all stand for our call to worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a brief moment. And ask the Holy Spirit to show us where we fall short of God's standard of holiness, confess those sins, and receive the forgiveness that we have in the shed blood of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading this morning from the epistle, uh, Paul's epistle to the Romans chapter 4 verses 13 through 25. Hear the word of the Lord. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. 
not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. And our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The gospel of our Lord. Praise Let's all say together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Pastor Scott Hurd tells the story of a great big guy in full leather, bandana, beard, and tattoos who sat proudly at a traffic light on his absolutely gorgeous Harley Davidson bike. This is one of the most beautiful uh, motorcycles in town, not to mention fast. Everything about it displayed power. It was at that moment an older man in his 80s drove up on a moped. He commented on what a beautiful bike the Harley was. Mind if I take a look, said the older gentleman. Go ahead, came the grunted reply. That sure is a beautiful bike, said the older man. He got within inches of the bike and went over it from top to bottom. I bet it's fast too. You bet, said the owner. With that, the light turned green and the biker popped a wheelie, racing off down the road, zero to 106 seconds. Grinning, he looked back to see the old man was just a speck in the mirror. Suddenly, however, the speck grew larger and larger until the man on the moped went flying past him at incredible speed. It was amazing. The older man kept going until he was just a speck in the distance and then turned and headed right back toward the Harley. Again, he went zooming past the Harley this time in the opposite direction until he was just his back. The biker brought the Harley to a screeching halt, deciding he was gonna wait for the old man. The moped came up from behind with amazing speed, slammed right into the back of the Harley, crushing both vehicles. The man was thrown from the moped onto the ground and lay there stunned. The biker started to say, what's going on? But stopped, realizing the man might need help. Old man, are you okay? What can I do to help? To which the man replied, you could start by unhooking my suspenders from your Harley. <laughs> Moral of the story is simply this. Who or what we are connected to determines to a great extent where we're going in life. And Matthew, a tax collector in Israel was going down the wrong trail in his life. You see, tax collectors were hated in Israel. And you say, well, why? Well, the New English Translation tells us in its study notes that the Roman system of taxation was frequently characterized by tax farming, 
where an individual would bid to collect taxes for the Roman government throughout an entire district and then add a surcharge or commission, often exorbitant, which they kept for themselves as their profit. Tax collectors referred to in the New Testament uh, were generally not the holders of these tax contracts themselves, but hired subordinates who were often local residents. Since these tax collectors worked for Rome, even indirectly, they were viewed as traitors to their own people and were not well liked. In addition, the system offered many opportunities for dishonesty and greed, both of which were associated with local tax collectors. Now, Kyle Eidelman, pastor at Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, he says this, The biggest threat to the church today is fans who call themselves Christians, but aren't actually interested in following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Being a fan requires nothing. Being a follower requires everything. Think about yourself for a moment. What's the difference for you? I'm from Philadelphia, so I'm a fan of the Phillies, the Eagles, the Sixers, the Flyers. Whenever I'm channel surfing and I see a game with one of those teams, I stop and watch it for a while. But uh, other than knowing Jalen Hurts for the Eagles and Embiid for the Sixers, Bryce Harper for the Phillies and Carter Hart for the Flyers, I don't know much about those teams. I don't know their records, where they played, where they came from, their home country, nothing. I'm a fan, not a follower. Now, pro golfers, that's another story. I follow those guys. I know their one world golf rating and ranking. I know how much money they've earned in their careers. See how many shots they've gained in approach and everything else. How about you? Do you have a favorite team that you follow? In North Dakota, everybody was Viking fans. Some were real followers. They have the jersey of their favorite player on as they come to church, and some of you do here as well. They know everything about the Vikings or the Packers. But what about Jesus? Are you a fan or a follower? Am I a fan or a follower? The kiddos, this, this, these last two days at VBS, learns that Jesus cares for you. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, we're to thank him for that care. Because he cares and saved us by faith alone in Jesus, God wants us to be followers, not fans. Paul tells the believers at Corinth this very truth. 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15, he says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We live for him not to be saved, but because we are. He died in our place. He paid the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven for all eternity. He took that on himself, that penalty. And we are to live thankfully. That's what following Jesus is all about. Not living for ourselves, but for him. Matthew was connected to money. He was living for money. Tax collectors were a greedy lot. And he was not well liked at all for this. And yet Jesus calls him. Matthew 9, 9 tells us, As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. Jesus had been in the Gadarene region on the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee. Remember there, he cast the demons, legion, out of the Gadarene demoniac. And after that, he headed, uh, left that region and traveled to the other side of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum on the northwest shore. There he healed a paralytic and forgave him his sins. We read in verse 9, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax booth. Follow me. The New, Internet, New English translation tells us what the tax booth was and where it was. The tax booth was a booth located at a port or on the edge of a city or town to, to collect taxes for trade. These taxes were a form of customs duty or toll applied to the movement of goods and produce brought into an area for sale. As such, these tolls were sort of a sales tax paid by the seller but obviously passed on to the purchaser in the form of increased prices. 
That is why Matthew and tax collectors were hated so by the Jews. Apparently, tax collectors gouged everyone in Israel as they worked for the Roman government. What is amazing to me is that Matthew doesn't ask Jesus a thing. Jesus says, follow me, and he does just that. There's no back talk. There's no nothing. He leaves everything. What about you and me? If Jesus came to us like he did Matthew and said, follow me, what would we say or do? Oh, I've got a lot to do today, Jesus. I've got to mow the grass and get things done. But I'm a family. I've got to see them first before I go with you. I mean, we could come up with all kinds of excuses, couldn't we? I sure could. I'm not trying to guilt any of us into following him this morning. Because we aren't saved by following him. We're saved by faith and trust in him alone and what he did for us on the cross. But the general tenor of scripture indicates that if you've trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll want to follow him the best you can by God's grace. I want to ask the kiddos here this morning if any of you has a cat. Does any kiddo have a cat here this morning? We get some cats. Do cats ever follow you? No, they thank you for the honesty. Cats go, they do what they want to do. They go where they want to go. You can't control cats. It's really hard. How about a gerbil? Anybody have a gerbil? No gerbils? What have we got? Discrimination against gerbils here? What's going on? Hamsters? Parents wind up cleaning those up. That's a mess. Hamsters are awful. But, uh, or a turtle or a goldfish. Do they follow you? No. He what? He follow your finger. <laughs> and how about anybody have dogs here this morning? Yeah. And do they follow you? Yes. They do. Why do they follow you? <laughs> that, what? Why do they follow us? You're, you're, are you kind to them? You give them food. You pet them. You're nice to them. And guess what they say in response? I'm going to follow you. Jesus cares for us. Thank you. Right? And that's what Jesus wants. Not that we're puppies. We're not puppies for Jesus. No. But because he cares for us, we say thank you. And we say thank you by following him. And how do we follow him? By keeping his commandments. The two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's how we do that. But that's impossible, is it not? Can we all just admit we don't do that the way God would have us to do it? We're sinners, are we not? And if it wasn't for God's grace and the Holy Spirit, we couldn't do it. But Jesus reaches out and takes in Matthew, a despised tax collector, because Jesus is full of mercy and grace. And it looks like because of the grace and mercy that Matthew experienced, he went out and told others about Jesus. I say that because we read in verse 10. And as Jesus reclined the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Do you see that? Many tax collectors and sinners came and joined Jesus and his disciples for dinner. Michael Green says in his commentary on the meal in Matthew, such a conversion, Matthew's, is worth a party. And Matthew throws one. And we see Jesus totally at home with a bunch of crooks and sinners. I want to follow that guy. Right? I want to follow him. Brendan Manning writes in his book, The Ragamuffin Gospel. If you've never read it, get it. It's life-changing. Jesus spent a disproportionate amount of time with people described in the Gospels as the poor, the blind, the lame, the lepers, the hungry, sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, persecuted, downtrodden, captives, those possessed by unclean spirits, all who labor and are heavy burdened, the rabble who knew nothing of the law, the crowds, the little ones, the least, the last, and the lost sheep of Israel. In short, Jesus associated with ragamuffins. So kids, how does this play out for you guys? In school. Do you ever see that kid sitting alone at the lunch table? No. No? <laughs> well, stay with me here. Stay with me. Right. Sometimes you do. What would Jesus do? Would he avoid that person or would he go sit with them? 
He would go sit with them and say, how are you? What's going on with your day? How's school? What's happening? He welcomed everybody. We don't exclude anybody. Jesus welcomed everybody, sinners, tax collectors, the whole bunch. And we're to be the same. And I just have to ask us as adults, and I convict myself here. Do you have any unchristian friends? Not in their actions. I mean, they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's, it's easy as Christians to just hang out with Christians. Jesus didn't do that. That's why I love the golf course. I can always play with guys who maybe don't know Jesus. I played with one guy one day back in Texas. And this guy was interesting. Every other word was a cuss word. And I asked him all about his life and what he was doing and this, that, and the other. Finally, on the 16th, all he says to me, so what do you do? <laughs> I love doing this to people. It's fun. He goes, I said, well, I'm the pastor of First Church over here. He goes, holy ass, why didn't you tell me sooner? <laughs> I had an opportunity there to share Christ with him. Maybe, I, I think, I hope I did. But we got to have non-Christian, we got to have people around us that don't know Jesus. And somehow just bring them one step closer. That's all we're asking you. It's all God's asking us to do. Uh, the Pharisees didn't understand it, did they? They said, why do your teacher eat with, with uh, tax collectors and sinners? The Pharisees separated themselves. In fact, the word Pharisees, I didn't know that means separated ones. They couldn't be with sinners who were not righteous. They were trusting in their righteousness. But we sinners know we don't have the righteousness of God to get into heaven without Jesus. We were given that righteousness in the waters of our baptism. When we believed in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God clothed us with Christ's righteousness. And so when God sees us, he doesn't see my filthy works. He sees Christ's righteousness. And we can live with him forever. These Pharisees didn't understand. They couldn't be as righteous as God. They trusted themselves. So Jesus confronts them and says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. One commentary says, the Hebrew word for mercy, hesed, is close to meaning to faithful covenant love. I desire faithful covenant love that includes mercy and grace and forgiveness. It's according to Hosea, is more important than sacrifice, an aspect of ritual worship. They didn't get it. They were caught up in all the forms of worship. Remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, uh, you worship me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. We can check the box on Sunday, but what about our hearts? Remember what Jesus said to Peter three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? It's about our love for him. Not about checking the box. I was here on Sunday. But if we love him, we will be here on Sunday. More than not. So, like Jesus, we too are to welcome sinners because we're sinners too. And the object of God's grace and mercy is everyone is. Aren't we glad that we know we're sick? <laughs> that we all suffer from the disease of sin. Believers know there's no one healthy under God's expert uh, examination of our hearts. Green tells us in his commentary, there are lots of people who think they are. Such people do not see the need of a doctor. He says, the kingdom is a one-class society for sinners only. Now, you might be afraid. You might think, well, oh, man, I don't want to do this following thing. Because what if God wants me to go to Zambezi to be a missionary? We all kind of fear that, don't we? I went on a mission trip in 1978 around the world playing basketball, giving out Bibles, preaching the gospel. I had so much fun for six weeks. But we were in Indonesia, in Malang, Indonesia. And we're with missionary Jim Matsuda. And the Dutch had put canals in Indonesia. And that canal was filthy, full of debris and everything else. And somebody's down in there trying to get stuff out of it they can sell. And I'm looking down there and I'm going, oh my goodness. And Jim's going, I just love this country. And I'm going, God, get me out of here as quick as you can. Because I'm not called. God will give you that calling. Don't worry. He's not going to put something in your way that you just have no ability, desire, or interest in doing. 
Jim Elliott was an American Christian missionary, one of five people killed during Operation Arca in Ecuador. It was an attempt to evangelize the Harunari people of Ecuador. He said this, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. May we focus on eternal things. May we focus on Jesus. And follow Christ as the Holy Spirit leads us and directs us. And as we follow, may we listen to the Holy Spirit's leading and follow as closely as we can. Remember, being a fan requires nothing. Being a follower requires everything. And all God's people said. Let's all stand and say the Apostles' Creed as the musicians come up to help us with communion at the end of the service. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He descended into hell. And he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up our hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is indeed right and sad to that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to his holy name and with the church on earth and the saints in heaven join in their unending hymn. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart is glad to say the words, you are holy, God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we continue to prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper, Join me in consecrating this holy meal for the last time we gather. We remembered when. On the night of his betrayal, our Lord took bread. He broke it as he blessed it, and then he said, My body given for you is what this means remember now my children what you have seen and then he took the chalice and raised it high my blood is given for you a full supply a covenant a promise a cleansing stream Remember now, my children, what you have seen. We share this meal together, remembering Christ. We share a common treasure and know the price. We share it without measure, a gift of love. We share our Let us join hands together and pray the prayer that the Lord Jesus Christ taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Let's stretch across the aisle. Great. Stretch across. Let's see. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. All are welcome at the table as it is the Lord's table. Come now and receive the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Come now. The Father's arms are open wide and there's room at the table for you. I think we're okay. We're okay. We're, uh, we'll come forward and take the, uh, uh, bread, the wine, and give thanks to God and we'll take it together. Then I 
Let's all stand. Thank you, Annie. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for the remission of your sins. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless our God. Praise and thanks to you. May God, creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light in our lives. May the spirit of love be our guide and path for all of our days. All of our days. Amen. What a wonderful way to start off the week. Thanks so much to all the kids coming, families as well to worship together, to give praise and thanks to our Lord. Jesus cares for us, does he not, kids? Thank you. That's right. Every, if you have any needs, problems, concerns, burdens, praises, whatever, call the office, call me at home, or call me on my cell. Never a burden, always a blessing to walk with you on your journey of faith, and you with me and my family. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Christ is with you. Be to God.
said it kind of comes off. Yeah. <laughs>